Chapter 4 from the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankenwheeler. Chapter 4 Claudia and Jamie awoke very early the next morning. It was still dark. Their stomachs felt like giant tubes of toothpaste that had been all squeezed out. Giant economy-sized tubes. They had to be out of the bed and out of sight before the museum staff came on duty. Neither was accustomed to getting up so early, to feeling so unwashed, or feeling so hungry. They dressed in silence. Each felt that pe peculiar chill that comes from getting up in the early morning, the chill that comes from one's own blood stream, for it comes in summer as well as winter. From some inside part of you that knows it's early morning. Claudia always dreaded that brief moment when her pajamas were shed and her underwear was not yet on. Even before she began undressing, she always had her underwear laid out on bed in the right direction, right for getting into as quickly as possible. She did this now too, but she hurried less pulling her petticoat down over her head. She took good long whiffs of the wonderful essence of detergent and clean cotton, which floated down with the petticoat. Next to any kind of elegance, Claudia loved good, clean smells. After they were dressed, Claudia whispered to Jamie, let's stash our book bags and instrument cases before we may man our stations. They agreed to scatter the belongings. Thus, if the museum officials found one thing, they wouldn't necessarily find all of them. While still at home, they had removed all identification on their cases as well as their clothing. Any child who has watched only one's, only one month's worth of television knows to do that much. Claudia hid her violin case in their sarcophagus that had no lid. It was well above eyesight, and Jamie helped hoist her up so that she could reach it. It was a beautifully carved Roman marble sarcophagus. She hid her book bag behind a tapestry screen in the rooms of French furniture. Jamie wanted to hide his things in the mummy case, but Claudia said that there, that was an unnecessary, unnecessarily complicated. The Egyptian wing of the Metropolitan was far too away from the bedroom. For the number of risks involved, it might as well be in Egypt. So the trumpet case was hidden inside a huge urn. And Jamie's book bag was neatly tucked behind a drape that was behind a statue from the Middle Ages. Unfortunately, the museum people had fastened all the drawers of the furniture so they couldn't be opened. They had never given a thought to the, the convenience of Jamie Kincaid. Manning their stations meant climbing back into the booths and waiting during the uh, perilous time when the museum was open to the staff, but not to visitors. They washed up, combed their hair, and even brushed their teeth. Then began those long moments. That, that first morning, they weren't quite sure when the staff would arrive, so they hid good and early. While Claudia stood crouched down waiting, the emptiness and the hollowness of all the museum corridors filled her stomach. She was starved. She spent her time trying not to remember delicious things to eat. Jamie made one slight error that morning. It was almost enough to get caught. When he heard the sound of running water, he assumed that some male visitor was using the men's room to wash up. He checked his watch and saw that it was five past ten. He knew the museum officially opened at ten o'clock, so he stepped down to walk out of his booth. It was not, however, a museum visitor who had turned on the water tap. It was a janitor filling his bucket. He was leaning down the act of wringing out his mop when he saw Jamie's leg appear from nowhere, and then saw Jamie emerge. Claudia was surprised at Jamie's choice, but she thought she knew. Wait, did I skip the page? Oh, yes I did, sorry. Where did you come from? He asked. Jamie smiled and nodded. Mother always says that I came from heaven. He bowed politely and walked out, delighted with his brush with danger. He could hardly wait to tell Claudia. Claudia chose not to be amused in such an empty stomach. 
the museum restaurant wouldn't open until 11.30, and the snack bar wouldn't open until after that. So they left the museum to get breakfast. They went down to the automat and used up a dollar's worth of Bruce's nickels. Jamie allotted ten nickels to Claudia and kept ten for himself. Jamie bought a cheese sandwich with coffee. After eating those, he still felt very hungry and told Claudia she could have 25 cents more for pie if she wished. Claudia, who had eaten cereal and, a, uh, and apple juice, scolded him about the need to eat properly. Breakfast food for breakfast and lunch food for lunch. Jamie's, Jamie counted with com, uh, countered with complaints about Claudia's narrow-mindedness. They were better organized that second day. Knowing that they could not afford more than two meals a day, they stopped at a grocery and bought small packages of peanut butter crackers for the night. They hid them in various pockets in their clothing. They decided to join a school group for lunch at the snack bar. There, they, there were certainly enough to choose from. That way their faces would always be in part of the crowd. Upon their return to the museum, Claudia informed Jamie that they should take advantage of the wonderful opportunity they had to learn and to study. No other children in the, all of the world, since the world had begun, had such an opportunity. So she set forth for herself and for her brother the task of learning everything about the museum. One thing at a time. Claudia probably didn't realize that there's the, the, realize that the museum had over 650,000 works of art. Even as she had, even if she had, she could not have convinced, been convinced that learning everything about everything was not possible. Her ambitions were as enormous and as multi-directional as the museum itself. Every day, they would pick a different gallery about which they would learn everything. Jamie could pick first. Claudia would pick second. He third, and so on. Just like the television schedule at home. Jamie considered learning something every other day outrageous. It was not only outrageous, it was unnecessary. Claudia simply did not know how to escape. He thought he would put an end, a quick end to this part of their runaway career. He chose the galleries of the Ital Italian Renaissance. He didn't even know what the Renaissance was, except that it sounded important, and there seemed to be an awful lot of it. He figured that Claudia would soon give up in despair. When she gave Jamie first pick, Claudia had been certain that he would choose arms and armor. She found, she herself found these interesting. There were probably two days worth of learning there. Perhaps she might even choose the same on the second day. This is a map of all the different exhibits in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's the first floor and the second floor. Claudia was surprised at Jamie's choice, but she thought she knew why he chose the Italian Renaissance. She thought she knew because along with tennis, ballet, and diving lessons at the Y, she had taken art appreciation lessons last year. Her art teacher said she, that the Renaissance was a period of the glorification of the human form. As best she could figure out, that meant bare bodies. Many painters of the Italian Renaissance had painted huge, billowy, bosomly naked ladies. She was amazed at Jamie. She thought it was too young for, he was too young for that. He was. She never even considered the possibility that he wanted her to be bored. She had given him first choice, and she was stuck with it. So she marched with him toward the long, wide stairway straight in front of the main museum, which led directly to the hall of the Italian Renaissance. Find it on the map. Italian Renaissance. I don't see it on the map. Hmm. Have to look later. Okay, well, I'm moving it on the map. I don't know. I'll look for it later. Here. Okay. If you think of doing something in New York City, if you could be certain that at least 2,000 other people have the same thought, and of those 2,000 who do, about 1,000 will be standing in line waiting to do it. That day was no exception. 
there was at least a thousand people waiting in line to see things in the Hall of the Italian Renaissance. Claudia and Jamie did not think that there was anything unusual about the size of the crowd. This was New York. Crowded was part of the definition of New York. To many art ex experts, Saxonberg, crowded is part of the definition of Italian Renaissance, too. It was a time much like the, this. Artistic activity was everywhere. Keeping track of the artists of the 15th and 16th century in Italy is as difficult as keeping track of the tax laws in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, and almost as complicated. As I reached the top of the stairs, a guard said, line forms to the right, single file, please. They did as they were told, partially because they didn't want to, be, to offend any guards or even attract any att attention, and partially because the crowd made them. Ladies' arms draped with pocketbooks and men's arms draped with coats formed a barrier as difficult to get through as barbed wire. Claudia and Jamie stood in the manner of all children who were standing in line. They stood leaning back with their necks stretched and their heads tilted away, way back making a vain effort to see over the shoulders of the tall adult who was always appears in front of them. Jamie could see nothing but the coat of the man in front of him. Claudia could see nothing but a piece of Jamie's head, plus the coat of the man in front of Jamie. They realized that they were approaching something out of the ordinary when they saw a newspaper camera walking along the edge of the crowd. The newsman carried a large black flash camera, which had time sketched in white on its case. Jamie tried to slow down to the pace of the photographer. He didn't know what he was having his picture taken for, but he liked getting his picture taken, especially for a newspaper. His picture had been in the paper at home. He had bought seven copies of the paper and used the pages for book covers. When the book covers began to tear, he covered the covers with saran wrap. They were still in his bookcase at home. Claudia sensed danger. At least she remembered that they had run away from home, and she didn't want any New York paper advertising her whereabouts. Or Jamie's either, especially if her parents happened to be looking for her. Someone in Greenwich was bound to read the New York Times and tell her faults. It would be more than a clue. It would be more like booking anyone looking for them on a chartered bus straight to the highway. Wouldn't her brother even ever learn about inconspicuous? She shoved him. He almost fell into the man in, into the man in the coat. Jamie turned to Claudia and gave her an awful look. Claudia paid no attention. For now, they reached what everyone was standing in line to see. A statue of an angel. Her arms were folded and she was looking holy. As Claudia passed by, she thought that the angel was the most beautiful, most graceful little statue she had ever seen. She wanted to stop and stare. She almost did, but the crowd wouldn't let her. As Jamie passed by, he thought that, that he would even get, that he would get even with Claudia for shoving him. They followed the line to the end of the Renaissance Hall. When the velvet ropes that had guided the crowd by creating a narrow street within the room ended, they found themselves going down a staircase to the main floor. Claudia was lost in remembrance of the beautiful angel she had seen. Why did she seem so important? And why was she so special? Of course she was beautiful, graceful, polished, but so were many of the things in the museum. Her sarcophagus, for example, was the one that the violin case was hidden in. And why was there all the commotion about her? The man had come to take pictures. There would be something about it in the pickups paper. They could find out from the newspapers. She spoke to Jamie. We'll have to buy a New York Times tomorrow to see the picture. Jamie was still mad about the show. Why would he want to buy the paper? He wouldn't be in the picture. He chose to fight Claudio with the one weapon he had, the power of the purse. He answered, we can't afford a New York Times. It costs a dime. We've got to get one, Jamie. Don't you want to see what's so important about that statue? Why everyone is standing in line to see it? Jamie felt that letting Claudia know that she couldn't get away with shoving him in public was more important than his curiosity. Well, perhaps tomorrow you can push someone down and grab his copy of the paper when he's trying to get up. I'm afraid, though, that our budget won't allow this expense. They walked for a short while before Claudia said, 
I'll find out some way. She was determined about that. She was also determined about learning. They wouldn't skip a lesson so easily. And so we can't learn everything about the Italian Renaissance today. Let's learn everything about the Egyptian ones. That will be our lesson instead. Jamie liked the mummies even if he didn't like lessons. So they walked together to the Egyptian wing. There they encountered a class that was also touring the halls. Each child in the class wore a round circle of blue construction paper on it, which was written in magic marker. Grade 6 WPS. The class was seated on little rubber mats around a glass case within which was a mummy case. Within which was a mummy they were talking about. The teacher sat on, uh, sat on a folding stool. Both Claudia and Jamie walked, wandered over toward the class and soon became part of it, almost. They listened to the guide, a very pretty young lady who worked for the museum, and they learned a lot. They didn't even mind. They were surprised they could actually learn something when they weren't in class. The guy told them how mummies were prepared and how Egyptians' dry climate helped to preserve them. She told them about digging for tombs, and she told them about the beautiful princess, sit hot for it, Yunset, Yunya, whose jewelry they would see in another room. Before they left this room, however, she wanted to know if there were any questions. Since I'm sure this group was a typical, it was typical of all school groups that I've observed at the museum, I can tell you what they were doing. At least 12 members were busy poking each other. 12 were wondering what they would eat. Four were worried about how long it would be before they could get a drink of water. Only Jamie had a question. How much did it cost to become a mummy? The pretty guide thought he was part of the class, and the teacher thought he was planted in the audience to pep up the discussion. The class knew he was an imposter. When they bothered to notice Claudia, they knew that she was one also. If the class had the good manners that came with not caring, they would leave the imposters alone. The question, however, would have caused at least 10 of them to start po stop poking each other, six to forget about eating, and three others to find the need to drink suddenly less urgent. It caused Claudia to want to em embalm Jamie in a vat of mummy fluid right that minute. That would teach him inconspicuous. The guide told Jamie that some people saved all their lives so they would become mummies. It was indeed very expensive. One of the students called out, you might even say it cost his life. Everyone laughed. Then they picked up their rubber mats and walked to the next room. Claudia was ready to pull Jamie out of line and make him lean, learn another part of the museum today, but she got a glimpse of the room where they were going to next. It was filled with, with jewelry, case after case of it. So they followed the class into the hall. After a short talk there, the guide bid them goodbye and mentioned that they might enjoy buying some of the museum pamphlets on Egypt. Jamie asked if they were expensive. The guide answered, some are as inexpensive as a copy of the Sunday New York Times. Others cost much more. Jamie looked over at Claudia. He shouldn't have. Claudia looked as satisfied as the bronze statue of the Egyptian cat she was standing near. The only real difference between them was that the cat wore tiny golden earrings and looked a little less smug. They got the New York Times the next day. Neither Claudia nor Jamie bought it. The man who left, left it on the counter while he was looking at the reproductions of antique jewelry bought it. The Kincaid stole it from him. They left the museum immediately afterward. Claudia read the paper that they while they ate breakfast at Horn and Hair and Hard Arts. That morning, she didn't eat breakfast food for breakfast. Crackers and roast chestnuts in bed at night satisfied only a small, small corner of her hunger. Being hungry was the most inconvenient part of running away. That uh, she meant to eat hardly, uh, heartily for every cent Jamie gave her. She bought macaroni and cheese casserole, baked beans, and coffee that morning. Jamie got the same. The information they wanted was on the first page of the second section of the Times. The headline said, Record Crowd Views Museum Bargain. There were three pictures, one of the record crowd standing in line, one of the statue itself, and one of the director of the museum with an assistant. 
The article was as follows. Saxonburg, you can find the original of the newspaper in my files. It's one of the 17 cabinets that line the north wall of my office. Officials from the Metropolitan Museum of Art report that 100,000 people climbed the Great Stairway to catch a glimpse of one of its newest acquisitions, the 24-inch statue called the Angel. Interest in the marble piece arises from the unusual circumstances attending its acquisition by the museum and from the belief that it may be the work of the Italian Renaissance master Michelangelo. If proof is found that it is an early work of art of Michelangelo, the museum will have purchased the greatest bargain in art history. It was purchased at an auction last year for $225. Considering that recent Prince Franz Joseph II accepted an offer of $5 million for a small painting by Leonardo da Vinci, an artist of the same period and of similar merit will give some idea of how great a bargain this is. The museum purchased the statue last year when one of its curators spotted it during a preview showing of works to be auctioned by the Park Burnett Gallery. His initial suspicion that it was a piece of work of Michelangelo's was confirmed by several other museum officials, all of whom kept their thoughts quiet in a successful effort to keep the bidding from being driven high. The statue had been the subject of exhaustive tests and study by the museum staff, as well as art experts from abroad. Most believed to, it to have been done about 450 years ago, when Michelangelo was in his early 20s. The statue acquired by the Park, the Park Bern, uh, Bernay Galleries from the collection of Mrs. Basil E. Frankenwheeler. She claims to have purchased it from a dealer in, um, in Italy before World War II. Mrs. Frankenwheeler's res residence on East 63rd Street was long a Manhattan showplace for what many considered one of the finest private collections of art in the Western Hemisphere. Others considered it a gigantic hodgepodge of the great and the mediocre. Mrs. Frankenwheeler closed her Manhattan residence three years ago. Important pieces from its contents have been found their way to various auction galleries since then. Mr. Frankenwheeler amassed a fortune from the, coin, the corn industry and from developing many corn products. He died in 1947. Mrs. Frankenwheeler now lives in her country estate in Farmington, Connecticut. Her home, which at one time was open to the greats of the world of art, business, and politics, is now closed to all but her staff, her advisors, and a few close friends. The Frankenwheelers had no children. The museum spokesman said yesterday, whether or not conclusive proof will be found that this was, was the work of Michelangelo. We are pleased with our purchase. Although Michelangelo is perhaps best known for his paintings of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, he always considered himself a sculptor and primarily a sculptor of marble. The question of whether the museum was acquired, one of his lesser known masterpieces still awaits its final answer.